1 through 18. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet high and 9 feet wide. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to assemble the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to attend the dedication of the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces assembled for the dedication of the statue the king had set up. Then they stood before the statue Nebuchadnezzar had set up. A herald loudly proclaimed, People of every nation and language, you are commanded. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the gods, the gold statue of King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, and every kind of music, people of every nation and language fell down and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Some Chaldeans took this occasion to come forward and maliciously accuse the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, May the king live forever. You as king have issued a decree that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music must fall down and worship the gold statue. Whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are some Jews you have appointed to manage the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men have ignored you, have ignored you, the king. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Then, in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar asked them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue I made. But if you don't worship it, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. Who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God who serve, if the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of the blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. First of all, before we get started, I wanted to point out that this month, marks uh, two years since we moved out here and have no regrets about that. It's been a great two years and look forward to what God's going to do in the years to come. And I'm excited about this morning because of the passage of scripture that, uh, this, that we're looking at this morning. It gives one of my favorite comments in all of the Bible. And what I believe are some of the most powerful words that any follower of God has ever spoken. But I'm not going to give it away just yet, okay? Now, a theme that I see running through the book of Daniel is the pressure to compromise. And you see that the title of the message this morning is Under Pressure or Fire, Fire, Baby, as an alternative title. Some of you might understand what that's referencing. We're looking at Daniel 3, 1 through 18, and um, if you have a bulletin, there's also an insert in your bulletin that has an outline that you can follow along with the sermon, and there's blanks that you can fill out, and you can take notes along the way. Uh, <clears throat> so, the pressure to compromise, the, that theme in Daniel, we've seen it. We saw it uh, not long ago when Pastor Toby was able to preach on the passage where Daniel and his friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were pressured to compromise on the dietary laws that God gave them. And they didn't compromise on their diets, which I'm sure we can all say this morning as well, right? Maybe not. It's only, 
We just started February, so that means the gyms will start clearing out again. But, uh, and as we look at chapter 3, we're, we see that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or I will sometimes refer to them as Shakrach and Benny, they face an even greater pressure to compromise. But this time it's not in what they eat, but rather in whom they worship. And so let's set the stage here and really picture what's happening. So King Neb, or Nebuchadnezzar, I'll call him King Neb sometimes, he makes this huge image. Okay, we don't know exactly what the image was. We don't know exactly what it looked like. It may have been of him. It may have been something else. But we do know that it was 9 feet wide and 90 feet tall. Now, can you picture that? Maybe I can help you a little bit this morning. I mean, 9 feet's not that hard. Let's see, that's probably going to be about you know, just a little bit more than me, three feet more than me, so me and a half, you know, and uh, so that's nine feet, but 90 feet would be from about the stage to, well, it would go all the way to where our, uh, you know, our stairwell back here by our exit doors, basically all the way back to those stairs is roughly about 90 feet, and so you're looking at a little nine feet wide and then 90 feet tall. Okay? And that, so it's a big deal. It's a big statue. And then he gets everybody who's anybody together to come to this huge celebration, this dedication, this big ceremony. And, and it's, it's a big deal. Picture like all the senators, all the congressmen, all the national and state leaders, all the judges. You know, this is a big deal. And then he's got the biggest and best orchestra that you can get. Right? And when that orchestra plays, you show your submission to the king, right? And not just any old submission, right? We're not, just, we're not talking about just the common respect that you show to the king. We're not talking about just being a, a typical law-abiding citizen or anything like that. We're talking about sovereign submission, worship. And what happens? Well, we'll reread verse 7. Therefore, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp and every kind of music, people of every nation and language fell down and worshipped the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So he got exactly what he wanted. Everybody fell down and did exactly what he told them to do. Now, do you think that they all did this because they just loved Nebuchadnezzar so much? Because he was just, he was so darn admirable and he had just won the hearts of all the people and they were just ready? No. They were afraid, right? They felt like this was the only option, like there was no other way. This was the only choice that they had. And Dale Davis shared a story. Um, it was in the late 1930s in the heyday of Joseph Stalin adulation in the Soviet Union. And they were having a provincial meeting, and Stalin wasn't there, but his name was mentioned. And just his name being mentioned triggered a standing ovation by everybody, everybody who was there. And it also triggered a dilemma because nobody wanted to be the first one to sit down, right? Until eventually an elderly man who likely just couldn't stand any longer sat down. And his name was noted and he was arrested the next day. Now do you think that Joseph Stalin had just won that man's heart? No. No, but we, we need to think about this group of people that we see in this story, from people from every nation and language, bowing down before this gold statue. Who were these people? Now, many of them would have been people who worshipped a plethora of other false gods, right? Gods, not gods at all. There's only one true God. And, but, you know, these fake gods that have no power whatsoever. And so for them, you know, it's like, what's the big deal? This gold statue, that gold statue, this stone statue, that piece of wood, who cares? I'm not going to make a fuss over this. But it's not like Shakrach and Benny were the only Jewish people there either. Right? I mean, we have to assume that Daniel wasn't present because we know that he wouldn't have gone along with this. We don't know exactly why he's not in this story or where he would have been. He was an important guy. He very well could have been traveling at the time. But we know from 
the book of Daniel, that Daniel wasn't one to compromise. But still, there were other Jewish people present. And yet they compromised, even though they supposedly were committed to the one true God. They compromised. Why? Why? What excuses could they have been making that Shadrach and Benny didn't? And that's where I have, I have two questions for application throughout the message today. And, and I'm gonna, we're going to start with the first one now. You know, a lot of times application happens at the end of a sermon, but we're going to do some in the middle. We're going to do some at the end, too. Um, I think this story is it's, it's just an amazing story about an amazing faith, and I think there's a lot of application that we can look at today. Um, and so the first question is, what pressures us to compromise? Now, we know from the text that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did not compromise. We also know that everybody else did. And I believe that the Jewish people bowing to this image made excuses for themselves that we also often make for our own sins and our own idols. And we're going to look at five reasons that we... The, the things that pressure us to compromise. And I have to thank Danny Aiken and Rodney Storks for pointing out uh, many of these. The first is the situation excuse. Some would argue that it would be okay to bow in this situation because if they didn't, well, they would die. Right? It would be unreasonable to expect obedience in this, is in this instance. Right? They might argue that, well, we're not even the ones really making the choice, right? Nebuchadnezzar's making it for us. We don't actually have a choice at all. You know, this is the kind of choice that, the choice that we see in, like, action and thriller movies all the time, right? You know, you got the villain who, who kills somebody, and then tries to blame it on somebody else, right? Like, well, if you just told me what I wanted to know, then he wouldn't be dead. I didn't kill him, you did. You know, but that's Satan's scheme, isn't it? He tries to twist the way that we think about our choices. And it happens with all kinds of sin. Take, for instance, parents who hire a doctor to murder their child. And they tell themselves that that's the only option because of the situation that they're in. Because if we didn't, then we would suffer, or that child would suffer, or our other children would suffer. And we don't want to diminish the situations that people find themselves in. People get in very difficult, tough situations. But so were Shadrach, Shadrach and Benny, right? This was a situation. And it doesn't excuse our sin or disobedience. A bad guy in a movie doesn't get to blame somebody else for their choice to murder someone. A mom and a dad doesn't, they don't get to blame their situation for their choice to have their child killed. A Jewish person in Babylon doesn't get to blame Nebuchadnezzar for them bowing before a golden image. And neither do we get to blame our situation or anyone else for our sin. There is no situation that excuses sin. None. And what may be even more important for us to understand is that there is no situation in which sin will benefit us or God. No matter how many, no matter how long the list is that we make in our own minds about why it would. And so we have the situation excuse, and we also have the culture excuse. Rodney Stortz put it this way. He said, we don't want to offend our culture and ruin our witness. We will bow now so they will listen to us later. Right? This is, this is the type of satanic thinking that causes us to compromise our faith in the name of our witness, which is the most ironic thing that you can imagine, right? I'm going to compromise my faith so that I won't damage or hurt my witness. How backwards is that? It's like a parent who doesn't have their children involved in the church because they don't want their children to hate the church. Right? It's like, yeah, because 
they're going to they're gonna learn to fall in love with the people of God if they're never around the people of God. Right? It's backwards. And when we say it out loud, sometimes it's, it, it, we hear it like that, and it sounds foolish, but we say these kinds of things to ourselves all the time in many different situations, right? We convince ourselves why we don't need to share the gospel. We convince ourselves why we don't need to say that prayer with that person. We convince ourselves why we don't need to confront our brother or sister about their sin, but it's not an excuse. And closely connected to, and sometimes overlapping the culture excuse, is the greater good excuse. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have told themselves, well, it's better to compromise now and stay alive so that we can have more opportunities later, you know? What good are we dead? A little disobedience now for more obedience later. It's a greater good in the long run. You know, and again, we, we think that way, but we only think that way because we are looking at things through our perspective instead of God's perspective. Really, just like Peter when he rebuked Jesus in Matthew 16. Look at what he said. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And that is exactly what the enemy wants. He wants us to set our, things, our mind on the things of man instead of being obedient to the Lord. Because it doesn't take faith to operate by our own standards of obedience, right? It takes faith to be obedient to God because in our obedience, we place our faith in His ways. We tell ourselves, I don't understand why I'm in this situation. I don't understand why this would be asked of me, but I trust that being obedient to the Lord is the best path. And that takes faith. And another attempt to excuse disobedience is the silent protest excuse. They could tell themselves, well, you know, we'll go through the motions of bowing down with our bodies, but our hearts won't be in it. And this is where we try to separate our hearts from our bodies and say that we can be clean on the inside but dirty on the outside. Now, you can certainly look like a border collie on the outside but be as disobedient as, as a spoiled cat on the inside, but it doesn't work the other way around. You can't be obedient on the inside and disobedient on the outside. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the inside, inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. Danny Aiken put it this way, they will not adopt some spineless compromise that says something like this, well, we will bow on the outside, but we are really standing on the inside. But we do this. We do this in our own lives, don't we? we? We try to convince ourselves that we can compromise with our hands, with our feet, with our eyes, with our words, with our money, with our time, without compromising our hearts. But the thing about it is everything that we do out here comes from in there. It's flowing from the inside out. And so if there's something bad happening out here, there's something bad happening in there. And the last pressure to compromise comes from the forgiveness excuse. They could have told themselves, well, it's okay because God is merciful and gracious and will forgive us. 
You know, God is merciful and gracious, but that is not what his mercy and grace are for. His mercy and grace are given so that we can be transformed from the inside out and be warriors, not deserters. He, and he took our sins upon himself on the cross, and he defeated death and sin by rising from the grave three days later. Not so that we could throw salt in his wounds by being disobedient and chicken-hearted, but so that we could experience life. And we experience life through walking with him in faithful obedience. It is God's grace and mercy that enable us to not compromise in these situations what he did for us on the cross, that he sent someone to help us and the Holy Spirit to come and dwell inside of us, that he gives us hope and peace. These are the reasons that we can refuse to compromise. They're not the excuses for it. And when I use them as an excuse, then I'm putting my hope in the present. I'm putting my faith in myself and I'm getting my peace from my circumstances. But when I put my but I'd rather put my faith in God, I'd rather get my hope in eternity and get my peace through my confidence in my salvation. That's what allows us to not compromise. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have resorted to any of these ways of twisted thinking to convince themselves that it would have been okay for them to compromise. But they didn't. Instead, they remained faithful. They remained full of faith in God. Now, they didn't go out and protest the king's command. They didn't start a petition or a militia. They just remained faithful to his first commandment to have no other gods before him. And so let's reread their interaction with King Neb, starting in verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar asked them, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, is it true that you don't serve my gods or worship the gold statue I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, drum, and every kind of music, fall down and worship the statue I made. But if you don't worship it, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Now, at this point, if I were them, I would be thinking, uh, Neb, you know who the God is. He's the same God who told you what you dreamed and what it meant. He's the same God that not long ago you called the God of gods and the Lord of kings. But apparently, all of that was short-lived for him. Whatever sense or of humility he had before God that day with Daniel was long gone because of his lust for power. And now he's here calling God out. He's challenging him. And what do they say? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. Now, some translations will word of verse 17 like, God will deliver us out of your hand, or he will rescue us, right? And, but the reality is, either way they said it doesn't matter because of verse 18. And so in verse 17, we see that they are displaying confidence in God. Right? But then in verse 18, we see the kind of attitude that accompanied their confidence in God. And like I said before, it's one of my favorite statements in the Bible, and I believe one of some of the most powerful words that any of God's people have ever spoken. In verse 18. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. That is an amazing response. It's an amazing faith. It's an amazing attitude 
It's an amazing obedience. These three men displayed confidence in God, but with a humble attitude and unwavering faith. And so that brings us to my second question for application. How should we respond under pressure? And first, I want to say, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. These guys could have lost their confidence and crumbled in the heat of the moment. Get it? The heat of the moment. But they didn't. Now, many Christians do this, though. When they get an opportunity to display their faith, they start to doubt and they start to fear and they give into it. Just like Peter when he took his eyes off Christ in Matthew 14. This is when the disciples were out on a boat and they, Jesus starts walking on the water to them, okay? And then here's, here's what happens with Peter. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you have little faith. Sometimes we fantasize about the strength of our faith, but when it's time to display it, we discover that it was only a fantasy. Like a lot of people who watch American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> For those of you who, there's some of you who may not even know, but I competed in season nine of American Ninja Warrior in Daytona Beach. And when we lived in North Carolina, I became a pretty strong competitor in Ninja Warrior. Um, but I would meet people all the time who would watch the show and they would say to themselves, I can do that. No, they couldn't. The thing is, they both underestimated the obstacles and overestimated themselves. Is it not so easy for us to do the very same thing in our walk with Christ? to underestimate the obstacles and to overestimate ourselves. But that's why we can't keep our focus on the obstacles or on ourselves, right? We have to keep our eyes on Christ because it's not our power that's going to get through. It's His. It's His strength. Some people want to claim that being a Christian means your life is going to be, it's going to be easier, it's going to be comfortable. And that's a lie. Jesus is not a lawnmower parent. He doesn't mow down the obstacles in front of us. No, he carries us through them. So don't lose heart when the pressure comes. But on the other side, don't be arrogant. The other way that they could have gone is to have arrogant confidence in God rather than humble confidence. And we see their humility in verse 18, right? They displayed confidence. Like, we believe in what God is going to do. But even if we are wrong about that, and we could be wrong, right? They're acknowledging. They might be wrong, but it wouldn't matter. That's that humility. But instead, what Christians sometimes do, instead of losing heart and giving in to doubt and fear, they go to the opposite extreme and they become arrogant. And they want to start doing things like making declarations in God's name about what he's going to do. Uh, Dale Davis imagined that some Christians might like to rewrite Shackrack and Benny's response to something more like, Nebuchadnezzar, we're going to call down God's deliverance. We, O king, are going to bind the fire. They might start making declarations about what God's going to do. And there's a lot of that going around right now. The confidence in God is good. But the arrogance isn't, right? We can't have too much faith in God. But we can have too much faith in ourselves. 
and we can have misplaced faith. That's the predicament. On December 14th, a little girl named Olive died. She just stopped breathing. She was the daughter of one of the music leaders at Bethel Church in Redding, California. Her story quickly made the news and went viral because the family and the church went on a campaign for days, a, a whole week, I believe, in praying for her resurrection. I can't knock them for that. And, and the reality is it's a beautiful thing to see God's people unite in faithful prayer. That's not the problem. That's not a problem at all. But when you read some of the statements that they were making, when you read some of the requests, even Bethel's own statements and requests, you see a lot of declarations about what God was going to do. You see, sometimes almost what borders on command. And that becomes a problem because Olive was not resurrected. And that family needs a church with a strong theology of lament and suffering to help them through that tragedy. I learned from personal experience the difference between humble confidence and arrogant faith. When uh, the one summer I went to New York to help start a summer youth camp, and the band that was doing music that week had this drummer who was a young man, and he was battling cancer. And one night was just, it was a really powerful night, a really emotional night. And after the evening service, a group of us got together and we, we laid hands on him and we just started, we, we prayed. And I felt this overwhelming sense, like I was supposed to pray a prayer you know, declaring that he was going to be healed. And not the like, oh, he's healed in heaven kind of thing. I'm talking about the physical, this life, this earth healing. I'd never felt anything like that before. It felt like the Holy Spirit was just telling me to pray those words. And after camp, when I was back home, I was checking the band's Facebook page, like, all the time. You know, fully, I was just like, oh, where is it? I'm, I was, I knew that post was going to be made about his miraculous healing, right? And, you know, they say, you, you may know the saying, if you pray for rain, bring an umbrella. Metaphorically speaking, I had my umbrella. I was optimistic, I was confident, I was faithful, and, and eventually the band posted about his death. And that was, that was tough. And the reality is, if I wasn't so connected to Christ and, and Scripture and the church, then likely that would have shaken my faith a lot more. But instead, I prayed, I tried to learn, and I kept walking with Christ. And over time, as I grew closer to Him, and as I learned more about God's Word, I realized that I was just wrong. It wasn't the Holy Spirit telling me to pray that, that day. It was me. I was being manipulated by my feelings, by my emotions. Now, there was nothing wrong for me to pray for God to intervene, to, to heal him, to come in. But my faith was a little bit misplaced. And what was wrong of me to do was declare what he was going to do, because he didn't do it, did he? And what I've realized is that it is not my place to put words in God's mouth. He's perfectly capable of doing that for himself. And so instead of losing heart when the pressure comes, instead of becoming and having this arrogant confidence, 
we can be exactly what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego exemplified for us and have humble confidence in God. There are all kinds of things that try to get us to compromise. It might be our situation. And you might be in a tough situation. It might be the culture. It might be the idea of a greater good sometime down the line. It might be the thought that we can compromise on the outside without compromising on the inside. Or we might even use God's grace and forgiveness to try to excuse our disobedience. But when we face the pressure to compromise, we should neither lose heart or become arrogant, but instead have humble confidence in God that says, He is able. But even if He chooses another way, that doesn't change a thing for me. Danny Aiken said, it takes courage not to compromise, and your mind needs to be made up before the pressure comes. If you wait until the moment of truth, you may find out it's too late. I think he's right, which is my, why my admonition this morning for all of us is to make our minds up now. What are we going to do when the pressure comes? And what are you what are we already doing? Because for you, the pressure may already be there. You may be feeling it. And for some of us, it may be coming later. But we need to make our minds up now what we're going to do. Have humble confidence in God. Under pressure. Let's pray. God, it's amazing to read about three men like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Three men who didn't at the time even know Christ. Their hope was only in the, the coming Messiah who they didn't even know yet. And we have Jesus. We have the risen Messiah. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. Yet so often we crumble. Help us not to. Help us not to give in to any of Satan's little schemes to twist the way that we think to get us to compromise. When the pressure comes, God, help us not to lose heart. Help us not to take our eyes off of you and instead focus on the waves and the wind. help us to keep our eyes on Christ. When the pressure comes and our faith is being tested, help us to not become arrogant and misplace our faith. But help us to stay rooted in who you are, who you've revealed yourself to be, to be rooted in Scripture and the wisdom that it gives us. So that instead of making fools of ourselves and putting words in your mouth, we can just trust you. God, we pray that our minds would be made up. We pray that if there's anyone here who 
right now may be compromising their entire souls because they don't have a relationship with Christ. That they would stop compromising. But would instead repent and turn to you. Scripture says to taste and see that the Lord is good. Maybe there's someone here who they just haven't tasted yet. We pray that they would. We know that you will not fail us. Thank you for being a God who always comes through. We'll see next week how you came through for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But again, even if it hadn't happened that way, you would still be a God who comes through. And that's never going to change. We praise your name. You are holy. You are magnificent. May your name be glorified in this church. May it be magnified. May we be a beacon to this community, to our world. We pray these things in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.